these instructions here are also uh, explaining. For those of you who are listening in English, you're fine right where you are. You'll hear all the presentations in English today. So let's go ahead and get things started. Hopefully everyone is in their language of choice. Uh, our webinar today takes place in two halves. Um, first, going from now until 1030, we're going to focus on specialty crops. That means vegetables and fruits. Um, and then uh, the second half of today's webinar from 1030 until noon is going to be focused on livestock operations, both dairy and uh, meat. Both halves are really emphasizing long-term projects, um, what you know, we would consider drought resilience. So our first webinar session back in May was focused kind of on the moment of crisis, accessing financial relief um, and changes to practices for this season to weather the current drought. Our emphasis, our emphasis today is on projects that will probably take time to implement, and may not necessarily have any benefits for you during this year's drought, but for which uh, you may see benefits in the coming years. In other words, these are things that hopefully will get you set up for the future droughts, um, which inevitably will come. And that's our real focus for today. So um, with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our first speaker on that theme. Uh, and for that, we're going to go to John Gorman. John is a, a senior ag program advisor with UCCE in Sonoma County. Uh, he's also the vineyard manager at Stolmeyer uh, or Stolmuller Vineyards. Um, and he's going to be talking about some projects uh, related to irrigation systems in specialty crop uh, environment that you can put into place to build your resistance uh, to future drought. And with that, I'll go ahead and, and go to John. Hi, John, you're muted. Sorry, everybody. Uh, so thanks, like Vince said, uh, I'm the Senior Agricultural Program Advisor for uh, the Extension Office in Sonoma County. Also, I manage 150 acres of planted vineyard, uh, mostly Cab and Chardonnay in Alexander Valley. Uh, also do about 400 acres of rangeland uh, calf cow operation there. So, you know, the droughts uh, impact us quite a bit uh, with the vineyard and the cattle and uh, the curtailment with the water rights uh, in the Russian River Valley has also impacted uh, both agricultural operations. So uh, because of that, we're, we're, we're finding uh, various other sources uh, to try to supply our water needs there. and. Um, some of this uh, deals with those operations on the ranch and uh, some other operations that we've been dealing with, uh, trying to create more resilient water sources, uh, not only there, but, uh, but in other ag operations around the county. Um, so the idea is that we're, you know, developing a more redundant and sustainable water resources so that we're not relying on a single water source that may be not only curtailed by the state, but curtailed by the, the local needs of the aquifer. Um, so, you know, our, our needs can be not only on our, our property where our, our uh, you know, fruits or vegetables are being grown, but also in the aquifer that, that runs hundreds of miles beneath that. Uh, so we have to look at what usually it's buying more equipment, which we're all maybe not so excited about, but that's part of, part of uh, creating more resilient uh, water resource structure for uh, for on farm use, and looking at what equipment would be necessary there is sort of our first step in uh, in a long term process of building more resiliency. Um, and we can look at what some of the more ideal outcomes will be uh, once you get that equipment. So, part of that is uh, looking for usually water wells that are outside of a curtailment area. Uh, we've on three different ranches, we've had a lot of re, uh, success 
looking at uh, actually looking at the uh, the geology beneath the ground uh, through USGS mapping and been able to find uh, older, uh, maybe not so explored fault lines. Uh, there in the fault lines, there are, there are large pockets of water uh, that, that can be exploited for, uh, for a secondary use. Um, of course, the, when you're looking for alternative sources of water uh, that are outside of a, of a curtailment zone, you need to be aware of, of not only where that water might be, but how you're going to extract that. Um, we there's we're can, we're going to go through a couple different methods that uh, to do so, uh, but the the first option here is really exploring how you're going to create a secondary system to the primary one that you may or may not be overtaxing or losing because of curtailments. Um, we found being able to to explore those alternative sites to create a, a redundant uh, source that's still tied in to your main water system is the cheapest way and usually the best way to, uh, to create a, a, a redundant system there. And this picture here, we've, we're able to, uh, to find a source through using a, a fault line map and, uh, and we did an exploratory well, which uh, found a, a fair amount of water there. Um, and we can, that's maybe not in the cards for everyone right off the bat, but uh, it, it can be, uh, it can be used as, as a extremely good secondary source. And so how do you judge whether that secondary source is going to be not just a, some pocket water, but instead something that's going to be uh, there for decades and decades to come? Well, that's obviously through a testing, uh, a pump test that uh, can be explored through multiple hours of pumping and then you see your recharge so you could do that now on your current wells as well as an exploratory well outside of your system uh, i recommend that because you get to see what your uh, what the available uh, uh, aquifer can allow now and can allow let's say in august if you need more water throughout that longer period of time um, usually we're looking for a, a, a shorter recharge. A recharge is how long it takes for that static water depth to come up to the original pumping level uh, where, where you started to pump that water out. Uh, there's, you, not all wells are, are, uh, are equal in that regard. And you'll have to be um, more cognizant of what your recharge availability is uh, going forward here. So even if you're not ready to explore new areas of, of potential water source outside of a, a curtailment zone, looking at your, your, your water source now through, uh, through a, a, either a, a pump test log through a water well company, or you can do it yourself through a sound tester uh, and start taking notes similar to those exposed here. Uh, it gives you a much better understanding of where your water depth is and how fast your recovery rate is so once you know that, you can better source your storage capacity. Uh, only thing better than having a second redundant water source is having a large storage capacity. You can get away with a, a, a smaller water source just through expanding your storage capacity. Well, there's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a, uh, a done deal to have a large storage capacity. You also need uh, many different types of that capacity, depending on your needs. Some needs won't be able to be fully satisfied by just storage capacity alone, and you'll still have to have a redundant uh, water delivery system. But we can look at certain benefits and, and drawbacks of, of different storage types. You know, you've, everyone knows the poly tanks, and uh, they're getting hard to come by just because of the storage uh, uh, needs now by everyone. But uh, they're 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 quick, they're easy, and uh, and can be tied together to increase uh, that storage fairly easily. Um, of course, in a larger setting, you know, five or more acres, poly tanks aren't really going to do it. Uh, in some smaller uh, some smaller vegetable crop operations, 
uh, you can you can potentially get away with a couple of uh, five thousand gallon tanks daisy chained together and uh, and enough recharge uh, in your groundwater to to keep those afloat. You're also when you're having storage, you're you're less um, just, you're not required to have such a large recharge capacity uh, through your water source. So tanks kind of give you a, a pressure release there as far as uh, needing a large amount of water right off the bat and then giving you a lot of time to recover that, uh, that recharge. Uh, there's also something that I don't see as much around that uh, they do use in uh, other counties and uh, other states are uh, large bladder tanks. Um, these are much cheaper, actually, for your uh, your gallons of water storage use than a uh, than a, a poly tank, uh, but uh, somewhat less. Th they will age faster than a poly tank, but you can also get about a fifty thousand gallon bladder. Uh, this one in the picture is a fifty thousand gallon bladder uh, for a fraction of the cost of the same amount of capacity in a poly tank. Um, both the poly tank, uh, well, all, all, of course, all storage capacities that we're talking about today require a secondary source to, uh, or a secondary uh, a motor source to pressurize your water and get it through your irrigation system. But I do see smaller, uh, smaller row crop operations uh, using bladder tanks successfully, and they are, uh, uh, they're very economical. And, uh, and you can, the only draw, one of the drawbacks on these tanks is that of course, you've got to be uh, pretty careful with the, uh, where you place them. <laughs> no grades, uh, nothing more than a 2% slope uh, on anything that you're doing with a bladder tank, or you'll be, uh, you'll be, your neighbor will be dealing with it down the hill. And of course, uh, we've got Storage ponds, probably our bet, your best, uh, your best bet as far as storing uh, uh, water that you can uh, use later in the season. Uh, of course, there's multiple uh, issues with that as far as just being having the land to to uh, to share one or to 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 have one built and the uh, uh, the construction costs and the civil engineering involved uh, can be very complex, but uh, they do. They obviously provide a lot of benefits, um, something that, that, that you could look into, but I would recommend if that is something that you're looking into, you can build one under, I want to say, uh, uh, 200 square feet uh, with, with minimal, with just a grading permit. Anything larger than that, you're going to need to uh, obviously get engineered, and, uh, and it's a little bit more of a rigmarole. But uh, that's, that's obviously something that, the, that uh, you can explore further with the county. Um, with, with all tanks, especially uh, uh, tanks that you're going to be uh, using questionable water source, maybe a water source you're less familiar with, you're going to need your filtration system. Uh, that's something that uh, uh, little these are dragon line filters and any media filters sand filters the such are uh, your first line in, in protecting a questionable water source going into your uh, your mainline system these uh, that's something that to look into of course a lot of people are going to auto flush filters and I'm exploring filters with you because all of these systems especially if we're exploring a system that has not been previously pumped as much, or perhaps we're getting to more of a lower part of our wells as we go further into this year, and we're doing more well tests to see where our depth is and our static recharge is, uh, that water will become less, um, uh, how do you say, potentially more particulates. So more filtration systems might be needed. Um, the auto flush filters are nice because they do not take, uh, they don't take any more labor other than the initial install and your, uh, it, it, they take care of themselves for the most part. Um, another thing that to look into after our, uh, you know, our secondary water storage is, uh, you know, how we're going to get it out of there. Um, the best idea that we're looking at now because of these alternative sources of, of water that we may be exploring are uh, low demand, high storage systems. 
uh, part of that is uh, is not knowing how much water we're going to be using right off the bat. So part of that is having uh, being able to have a, a various uses for that water, maybe a lot less than we've previously had before, meaning you can water less of the field than you were in a more water rich time. Uh, VFDs or variable frequency drives on your pumps are a huge part in being able to better manipulate your water pressure without using so much water at once to stabilize the system. Uh, they also are very good with saving power and, and energy if it is a uh, if it is a uh, electrical pump uh, at any time. So I, we've always we have VFDs on on most of our our well pumps and uh, our secondary booster pumps, and we've had great success there. Um, the other thing to look at is uh, solar uh, DC, so direct current systems. So in a direct current system, uh, usually they're they're way out in the field, as you can see in the picture here. A couple of swallows took up nest here and. Uh, and you don't often go out to these systems because there are out in the, in the middle of the field and you don't need to uh, worry about bringing any uh, AC hard, hard power out to them. Um, you don't always know where this uh, secondary water source is going to be created. And it usually isn't by any power uh, anymore because you already have a primary water source by that. So we've had some success in some slower, some slower wells through a, through a DC power system, uh, meaning solar. And, um, uh, and these pumps are usually uh, pumping at uh, between three and five gallons a minute. And, uh, and obviously only doing that for, um, uh, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, well, usually eight to, eight to 12 hours a day, depending on the time of the year. Um, with, those, with that system, obviously storage is a critical component because you're not getting enough water to, uh, to make a go of it in any sort of crop situation. So um, any of the previously mentioned storage systems are, are essential when you have a, um, a slow intermittent DC power system. Um, of course, you know, as any solar system, uh, displacement of your, of your infrastructure is important to get the most uh, sun exposure. That was, is critical for your, obviously your pumping. Uh, you don't usually have any battery backup in these systems. So if the sun's on it, it'll pump as long as there's water in your shallow well. Uh, so, so once again, you don't want to put this uh, underneath any trees. Um, so also these systems are all, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, exploring alternative sources for water. Uh, that's, that's not cheap. Um, a lot of programs that we're that we've explored, including Sweep and the Equip uh, CIC program, are uh, can can assist to a certain degree with uh, having programs that can not only help potentially do explore other systems uh, for your water source, but also um, provide potential technical assistance to see if that's feasible. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this because we have other presenters here that uh, are, are way more familiar with that. But uh, we've had some success with the SWEET program in the past here on, on providing con water conservation projects to, uh, to reduce our groundwater dependency. And also the CIC program through EQUIP um, have many other incentive programs that I'm interested in including uh, and that you also may be interested in, including the storage uh, of water and, uh, and also the, uh, the saltwater intrusion. So those are, are critical parts of uh, what we need to be looking at. And uh, to a certain extent, both of these programs can help quite a bit. Um, so I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have, but... Uh, Thank you for attending today's talk. Great. Thank you so much, John. Um, and uh, for those of you who have questions for John related to some of the systems he's describing, uh, down at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window, you should have a Q&A button. You can type your questions in there. 
um, and we'll go ahead and, and ask the presenters as we go along. Uh, so please be using that. And also, as we get to the end of this first session focused on specialty crops, we'll take a minute to answer any questions that have built up there in the Q&A box. So uh, please use that as we go along. Also, just so you know, the session today is being recorded uh, and we'll make that recording available later on. So if you miss anything or if there's some information that you wanna be able to go back over again, watch for that recording. Uh, we'll also be able to share the presentations themselves, and that way you can pull any information that maybe got past you uh, this first time around. Um, uh, so I'm seeing one question, John, um, asking about those fault lines that you mentioned in terms of, of finding a, maybe a, a better or more secure water source. And the question is, where do you find maps where those fault lines might be documented? Right, so the um, we found a lot of really successful fault line maps that can go into great detail through USGS online. Um, the county also has fault line maps, but they're also from USGS. So uh, we've had a lot of success through that, uh, and, and they have a great website online, United States Geologic Service. Okay. Um, and then as far as the uh, Water fire, the wildfire resiliency of polytanks. So <clears throat> we were actually, uh, the Kincaid fire came through our ranch and almost went over to uh, Fitch Mountain on the other side. We've had multiple polytanks burn. So I, I, and some of them were buried and some of them were above ground. So I couldn't say there's, there's obviously uh, uh, steel tanks as well, uh, aluminum and stainless steel tanks, but uh, for, for aluminum tanks, I didn't add those because usually the costs are extremely prohibitive. Long term, my, if, if you wanted to do a water storage um, with, a, with a, a large aluminum tank, I would actually prefer the, the, ex, the added expense of getting a civil engineer and doing a, 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 a pond, doing a reservoir. And I think long-term that is way better storage. You're providing wildlife habitat. It's a, uh, it, 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 not that aluminum tanks are not um, uh, useful, but they are very expensive and the costs can be, uh, to, can be similar to a, to a, a large reservoir with, with potentially, uh, uh, you know, they have a timeline. To, uh, you know, steel tanks are not are not forever, whereas a reservoir can be fixed at, at most times. Great, thank you, John. Um, so as we go along, folks, please do keep using that Q and A box. Um, John's gonna stick around, uh, and like I said at the very end, we'll come back to any questions that we haven't uh, dipped into uh, as we go along. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and thank you, John, um, and I'm going to introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, which is Nick Goodman, a senior soil conservationist with our uh, local USDA service center with the NRCS, uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And um, Nick is going to be talking about uh, a, a new uh, funding program through NRCS that could potentially pay for the types of projects that John's been discussing, as well as other kinds of projects that might grow your resilience as an operation um, in order to be able to weather future droughts. I see next slides are up. Uh, remember folks, as we go along, enter any questions you have into that Q&A box and we'll get to them as Nick wraps. Go ahead, Nick. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks Vince, can you hear me okay? Yes. We hear you great. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so like Vince said, I'm Nick Goodman from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So the NRCS, uh, what we do is we work with private farmers, ranchers, non-industrial forest landowners across the country uh, for conservation. So we can help with technical assistance or financial assistance. And what I'll be talking about today is through our financial assistance. And that is our newest program. It's called Equip CIC. So people that are familiar with Equip, uh, it's like that, but it 
adds on apart from our other program, the Conservation Stewardship Program. So California is one of four states, uh, they're all Western states that have uh, begun this pilot program for the CIC, the Conservation Incentives Contracts. And California was awarded $22 million in new money. And this money is separate from other farm bill money. So let's say you've had EQIP uh, contracts in the past, there were payment limitations of 450,000 for that. Uh, this one is separate, so you could get an additional up to $200,000. So what the CIC is intended to do is to help with big picture drought uh, resiliency. So we can help address immediate drought uh, needs and then also help you kind of plan more for the future. So these contracts are, are five-year uh, funding options. And for this part, I'm just going to talk more about the cropland stuff, but later in the program, I will also talk about uh, the range and pasture land stuff. And also, anyone interested, we can also do this for forest land as well. So how we can help on cropland. Uh, so we can do lots of types of cropland, including orchards, vineyards, organic or conventional. Uh, some common things we can do is micro irrigation, nutrient management, cover crops, mulching, uh, irrigation water management, and hedgerow plantings, which you might think hedgerow isn't really a uh, practice to conserve water, but we can do certain practices that are more uh, wildlife focused, including like structures for wildlife. But our typical scenarios for addressing uh, drought on cropland, the most common one is probably upgrading irrigation systems. Uh, so that's more with efficient things like micro irrigation. We can help with irrigation scheduling. So what we call irrigation water management. Uh, so with this, we help fund these soil moisture probes, uh, which go down in three different depths in your soil. And they basically record how much moisture is available in the soil. And you can kind of base your irrigation off of that, how much you want your uh, plants to be stressed for water. Um, another one is mulching. That's just great to keep the soil moisture in the soil. Uh, cover crops can also be done, uh, can also help with that. Invasive weed control to get rid of some weeds. And then residue and tillage management. So it's not as big as here, uh, or I haven't seen as big here, but like if you're going to no-till or reduce till, we can help fund for that. One thing I just want to mention for this as well, if you do have Grazing animals on your cropland, we can help with uh, livestock water systems. So that's tanks, troughs, and pumps, pipelines. Uh, but I'll talk about that more later. So some program eligibility. So like I said, you have to be an agriculture producer or non-industrial forest landowner. This is a five-year contract. So you have to have a five-year lease. Uh, you have to comply with our adjusted gross income. So you can't average making more than $900,000 over the last three tax years. And then uh, historically underserved clients are eligible for a higher payment rate for the practices. Uh, so not for the enhancements. So that's something uh, like equip practices, you can get a higher payment rate, but that additional enhancement, which is what makes this CIC special, uh, you would just have the normal CSP payment rate for that. So how to apply, how this process works. So with the federal government, it's longer process and we're looking at about a year out. So that's why this program, even though it's more focused on drought, uh, it's still longer planning for drought. So your first step would be to contact our office and then the next slide I'll have my contact information. Uh, you can set up a site visit, we'll give you an application, you'll apply for the program. So for this CIC, which is a special pot of money, that 22 million for California, you have to apply by July 12th. And if you applied for EQIP in the past, you'll have to reapply for this and you'll just have to write CIC above uh, the EQIP checkbox if you're familiar with it. Uh, we can, like, we'll help you walk through this too. Our next step then is to, while we're out on the site visit, we'll develop a conservation plan. So this is uh, us working with you to help address your resource concerns and what you want to achieve and how we can help. Uh, then that plan that we make, it's ranked. 
And so it's ranked against other ones in these. Uh, basically, we're not in the Central Valley or uh, the northern part of the state that uh, there's a basin up there that has a special ranking pool. So you'll be ranked like more with the, the coast area and the rest of the state. So you'll be competing against them for funding. And once uh, you're selected for funding or if you're selected for funding, then we'll go over all the documents with you and it'll be signed into contract. Like I said, that's a five-year contract for this CIC. Uh, after that is when a biological and cultural resource review is conducted. So that's why this is like a year out because we have to, any federal funding on projects, uh, there has to be biological and cultural resources review. And it just takes quite a while uh, to get those done. Uh, so that's why we say plan for probably next summer to be doing uh, the majority of your, your work. Uh, once those reviews are complete, the practices uh, can be inst installed and we give you these implementation requirements that tell you basically how to do it. Once the practices are installed, another site visit will be conducted. We'll inspect them, certify them to make sure that they meet our requirements. And then we certify the practices and it's direct deposited into your account. So here's my contact information uh, and my supervisor, Drew Logan Bill, his is there as well. Or you could just call our line and it's extension three for the NRCS side if you want to speak with anyone in the office. And at this point, I can take questions if there's any Q&A or we could do this at the end. That's great, Nick. We do have a few questions, so let's let's go ahead and, and have you uh, answer those. One of them um, broadly was sort of linked back to the last topic around reservoirs as a good um, alternative water source place to, to keep water. And uh, someone's asking about funding for that. Would the EQIP CIC program, would that potentially be able to pay for the development of a reservoir? Yeah, it's a, a little tricky for ours because for the creating ponds, our resource concern to be able to do it is for uh, wildlife, creating habitat for wildlife. So there, it has been done in other counties. I haven't seen it done in Sonoma Marin yet. Uh, it just takes a lot of engineering and it's mainly you have to have it tied back to a certain wildlife, which I think it's doable here, but it's not something that we typically do. We typically do like more of the livestock water systems with tanks and troughs. Okay, great. And we are actually just a little bit later in this morning session going to look at a, another uh, project that involved developing a reservoir and that was in partnership with a local RCD. So we'll hear a little bit about funding a reservoir through that mechanism as well. Um, Let's uh, go to another question, a question about that $900,000 AGI. Uh, is that combined for three years or is that uh, per year? Yeah, it's per year. It's your average per year cannot be more than the 900,000. Okay, great. And then uh, someone also asked about uh, the current equip, that sort of batch of, of projects that I think the funding uh, uh, sort of that application period closed in early June. Uh, so folks are asking about the ranking decisions for that batch. Uh, do you have any updates or, or anything yeah. to say about that? Yep. So those decisions were made last week. Uh, they were it was supposed to be made a little bit earlier, but uh, it got pushed back a little bit and they were made last week. So your you should reach out to your conservation planner if you have questions about it. And what we're trying to do is people that weren't funded for those ones. Uh, we're going to talk to them about the CIC because it's really easy for them to, it, you will have to fill out a new application and just write that CIC on there. But if they have already made a plan with you, you should be a good fit for this uh, CIC that we can hopefully throw you into. And if your project wasn't funded for the regular EQIP, hopefully we can change it a little bit, add a, a, an, e, an enhancement to make it eligible for the CIC and hopefully get you funded through this program. Great, thank you, Nick. I'm also seeing uh, a couple of questions that are um, from someone I think who's looking for urgent assistance right now uh, with water and, and assistance getting water, particularly the livestock. Um, I know that's not uh, related to your program, which is a much longer time horizon. 
Um, but I will say to Nicole, who's asking the question, um, Nicole, in our second session, we're going to go into long-term livestock projects, but our last webinar in early May was about near-term uh, projects, near-term access to uh, assistance, particularly through the FSA uh, for funding to pay for water hauling, um, as well as a program through Marin County. Uh, depending on where you are, if you are in Marin, there, uh, there is a, a program to help cover the cost of hauling water to livestock. Um, and uh, so those are some options if you want to go back and see that webinar. Um, and I'm not sure, Randy, did you want to chime in on this topic? I, I see our, our dairy advisor, Randy, um, maybe you want to add something while we're on this topic? Yeah, um, if you're in Petaluma, I would also say that we are hoping to offer a similar water hauling program in Sonoma County. Um, we do have more people who would want to access this water funding than in Marin County, but it should be a slightly larger amount of money. So if you have questions about that, you can email or call me. I will have some of my contact information later in the webinar, uh, but my name is Randy Black. So feel free to reach out to me and we can have some more conversation about resources right now. Great, thank you, Randy. Um, along those lines, um, if you do want to see the previous webinar, maybe we can get um, Karen Giovannini to put the link um, to the recording from that previous webinar in the chat. I know she put the link to those USGS fault line maps in the Q&A as well as in the chat box. So we'll keep putting you know, important links in the chat box for you. Uh, and so hopefully we can get the link to the last recorded webinar there into the chat so that you can easily access that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Randy is our uh, dairy advisor with UC, with UC Cooperative Extension in Marin and Sonoma. <clears throat> and I can see that link to the last webinar is in the chat now. Hey Vince, can I just add too, so you mentioned the Farm Service Agency, uh, their phone number is the same as mine up here, the 707-794. 1242, but their extension is two. So if you just put that in, that'll uh, get you their office and they can answer some questions you have about their programs. Thank you, Nick. And that's a good reminder. Um, so tomorrow, the 30th, the FSA, the Farm Service Agency, is going to be doing an all day sign up session uh, at the Sonoma County Farm Bureau office. We'll put up more details about that at the end of this uh, morning session. But just in terms of accessing some of those relief programs to fund both uh, replacement feed as well as to help pay for water hauling, um, that's a session that you could go to, get your paperwork signed and started right away. And that's happening all day tomorrow um, at the uh, Sonoma County Farm Bureau office in Santa Rosa. We'll put that information um, up on screen at the end of this session. So. Um, a little more detail on that coming. Hey, Vince, one, one more thing too. Sorry, yeah. uh, Drew and I will also be there. So if you are interested, uh, we can bring applications for that Equip CIC. So while you're talking to them, you could possibly also sign up with us. Great. And if nothing else, you get to meet Nick in person. <laughs> Thanks, Vince. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Um, all right. So um, with that, we're going to move to our next topic. Um, uh, our presenter for this topic happens to be me. Um, and uh, for that, um, we're going to be talking about some pond maintenance uh, work that you can be doing now during this period. Uh, just by way of introduction, <laughs> my name is Vince Trotter. I work with UC Cooperative Extension in Marin County uh, as our sustainable ag coordinator and as our agricultural ombudsman. So my role is to, to help farmers and ranchers with new enterprise, new ag practice, uh, that extend their viability into the future, and then as ombuds to help them navigate regulations and understand rules. Rules and regulations are definitely going to come into play when it comes to uh, ponds, either developing new ones or performing maintenance on existing ones. And during this drought, that's something that a lot of folks have been asking uh, over the years. Maybe their pond has filled in a bit with accumulated sediment, dead plant material, um, and they're thinking that they want to use this opportunity 
to dredge those, to clean out some of that sediment, restore the original capacity of their pond, maybe even put in a liner. Uh, and so today I'm just gonna take a few minutes to talk about some of the permits that uh, would come into play when doing that sort of work. So let me go ahead and share my presentation. So hopefully you folks are seeing those slides. And um, there's my contact information right there. We'll be able to share that later on. Um, and so, so we have your presenter view. Ah, okay. Let's see if I can. Uh, Are you seeing the normal view there? No, we're now just seeing your slide deck. Got it. Okay. Well, let's just go with it. Um, you guys will get a preview of each uh, of the next slides as we go through. Uh, so basically, we're going to focus on uh, some maintenance projects, including dredging out some accumulated sediment and then potentially putting in a liner to ensure that you're not losing some of that water um, down into the ground. Um, I know evaporation is a question that's been raised. Uh, I want to loop back to that when we do questions at the end, but um, liners may be a way that you can avoid losing it out the bottom. Um, one thing to know is we talk about these projects, <clears throat> both of those could be something that could be funded through a program like Nick was discussing through the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. It might be a project that you could be doing in cooperation with your local resource conservation district, like Marin RCD. Um, in Sonoma County, um, either the uh, Gold Ridge or the Sonoma Resource Conservation District might be a partner for a project like this. Uh, in fact, we're going to talk about not so much pond maintenance, but as I said, pond development um, in a minute uh, in partnership with an RCD. And then it's also possible that your local land trust could be a partner for a project like this. Uh, the Marin Agricultural Land Trust right now has a program called DRAWS, um, which they initiated during the drought for projects uh, that build farms resiliency for future droughts. Um, <clears throat> and this could be something that might be done in partnership with MALT uh, if you are in Marin County. So just know that these are, these are programs uh, that might not only help pay for the work, but also might help with some of the permitting. So in terms of permits, um, I want to start by just covering some basics um, <clears throat> about ponds. Uh, and this is something that is a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but um, most ponds in the eyes of the state are considered a stream. There are ponds that are built purely to catch and store rainfall, um, either off of a roof or just straight from the sky, or ponds that are built to capture sheet flow, which is um, not concentrated by the landscape, but just captured off of a hillside. But the vast majority of ranch ponds that you see in Marin and Sonoma counties are fed by a creek or stream some kind of landform that concentrates the water uh, in such a way that it that it travels in a channel and those may be ephemeral they may only be wet when when the rain is really coming down but if your pond is fed in that fashion then your pond itself is included uh, as part of the stream essentially as part of a water course and that means that all the agencies that have jurisdiction over a stream become uh, important players in a project where you might be digging out sediment. And so for that, <clears throat> um, for that, uh, that we're talking about the Regional Water Quality Control Board. We're talking about the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we're talking about the Army Corps of Engineers, potentially, although generally speaking, they're going to take a backseat to the Regional Quality Control Board. 
Um, more often than not, when a project is tied to agricultural production, the Army Corps of Engineers is, is going to sort of stand down. Um, and then if you're in Marin County, um, all of those agencies actually sit once a month in what's called the McStop Project Coordination Meeting. Um, this is basically a gathering of folks from the Regional uh, Water Quality Control Board, Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife. They all come together and you can bring your project. You can bring your dredging project, your pond lining project, and they all take a look at it. They all talk about what, if any, concerns they might have about it. And they're all going to um, take a minute and explain what they would expect from you. So um, that can be, for those of you who are in Marin County, a great way to understand what you're getting into uh, before you actually kickstart the process. Um, in, in a project like this, all of those entities are going to want to see that you do, in fact, have a formal water right. Um, and, and that means a, a license that could have been established 20, 30, 50 years ago. It might be a registration that was established sometime in the last 10 years. Um, but those, um, those certificates of your water right are going to be an important document in this because um, without it, the state doesn't really recognize your right to take and use water from this stream. And you can see I've got this picture taken from a um, an actual water right and highlighted it. it identifies that in this right you are taking water from an unnamed stream so again you can see written right into the right that they consider this pond to really be about a stream so <clears throat> some of these groups what are they going to uh, expect from you um, first of all let's look at uh, region two which is the water quality control board that covers um, Marin and a little bit of Southern Sonoma, they're the Bay Area Water Quality Control District. Um, they would ask everyone to file what's called a notice of intent under a, a general order, um, which governs essentially pollutions in a water body. And in this case, digging up sediment, disturbing that stream bed, that water course is considered a form of um, of pollutant in a way. And so because of that, you file this notice of intent, do it online through their system uh, uh, online. <clears throat> oh, sorry, that's, uh, that's uh, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, with region two, uh, the key here is that you're disturbing a relatively small area. So you can see in this picture, I've got a pond that holds, uh, this one holds about 18 acre feet. And I've identified that 0.2 acres of area for disturbance. So the idea is if you're trying to pull sediment out and restore um, your pond's capacity, stick to a relatively small area that your actual confines of this program and also be doing minimal disturbance to um, that water body. And in particular, you know, you're going to be avoiding any of the vegetation that might be on the edge, as well as at the bottom of that pond, right? Right, right at the bottom where maybe there is no vegetative life. Um, that's where you're gonna to wanna to focus the excavation. The Regional uh, Water Quality Control Board does have concerns around plastic liners, um, but they're open to conversation around the use of a clay liner, which I think is kind of what oftentimes is recommended anyway. So um, that's a topic that has to be explored project by project. Um, <clears throat> again, you're going to have to have evidence of your water right there. Um, and they'll work with you to develop any mitigation measures, uh, ways to avoid further damage to the surrounding um, environment, to the vegetative life, disturbing any other um, elements of the ecosystem there. Uh, and then there's a fee for that, which uh, starts at around 2000 and then grows with the size of that area of disturbance. Similarly, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife also has a notification program where, um, in this case, they are viewing this as an alteration to a stream bed. Um, and in it, then you go online and file your notification. Uh, generally speaking, it's a process that could take as little as 30. Um, as much as 60 and perhaps more. Um, 
And uh, in that, they could ask for certain alterations to the project. They might ask that you uh, put in place certain erosion control um, practices. They might ask that you avoid a certain area and focus on another area. So the terms of that work could actually vary a little bit as you go through the process with them. The fee there starts around 650 and then goes up in this case, not with the size of disturbance, because that's not really a, a part of this program, but rather the overall cost of the project. So whatever you're paying um, potentially to, um, you know, a, a dredging outfit or an excavator, um, that's going to drive the, the fee for this. The third group that I wanted to um, <clears throat> mention is, is your county. But before I do, just want to point out that with the Regional Water Quality Control Board, as well as Fish and Wildlife, again, you're going to need that proof of water rights. Um, you are going to need to be able to describe the project, how much roughly you expect to take out. Um, if you're looking to line it, what that liner is uh, consists of, um, you're going to want to have some photos of your pond and the surrounding area, including where water enters that pond and where it exits. Um, and then with both of those entities, if there's going to be a need to, to sort of mitigate your impact on that uh, pond and the surrounding area, that's going to sort of surface in the course of the process. So those two are essentially state entities, but your county uh, and specifically your Department of Public Works may very well also have a, a part to play here. Um, you can see in that diagram, there are certain ponds um, that are, you know, held with a dam um, and are so big that actually the county doesn't have a role. Those are called jurisdictional and that means the state actually has some authority. In Marin County, we only have two or three um, uh, private dams that are jurisdictional. The vast majority of them fall under the county's um, dam ordinance. And so that's that yellow uh, part of the graph there. And basically what this means is that you may need to um, contact your Department of Public Works and either uh, notify them of your intent to do work uh, maintaining an existing pond. Um, they may want to come out and inspect. They may um, ask you to actually apply for um, a permit related to their stream program um, or their dam ordinance. Um, it's not a project that, that at least Marin County has had to deal with very much. And so um, there's a, a number of factors that would come into play. Um, the other element is that all of these entities, state and local, have to ensure that the project complies with what's called CEQA, which is a California rule that is essentially in place to um, establish the level of impact by a project on the environment. And oftentimes the county is the entity that's going to determine whether and how much um, this is impacting the environment. The county can issue a uh, essentially a, a waiver, a notice of exemption for a project. And that, like I say, would probably be established at this level. And then grading permits, at least in Marin, when attached to an agricultural operation are also sort of waived. So those may be uh, able to be set aside by your county. Um, a couple of other last considerations for a project like this. Um, you should probably do a survey first before you start hiring a contractor and going down this road. Uh, I've talked with numerous ranchers who, after they actually surveyed the pond, discovered that even with sediment over the last 20 years, they're still getting their full licensed uh, um, quantity of water. Um, and so uh, it's key to note that these are all maintenance projects. They're not about expanding the capacity because that's already set by your water license. So you may need to survey things first to establish whether or not this is even a project that's <clears throat> worth doing. Um, and also just note that if, if it is uh, in terms of, um, you know, gaining capacity back to your original amount, start now because uh, Fish and Wildlife Water Quality Control Board, all of those take time. Uh, if, if you don't have a pond and you're looking to start a new pond, um, which is something we've explored with previous speakers, um, our website, grownandmarin.org, has a page for farmers and ranchers devoted to issues related to water. I've got the link there. Um, 
that is somewhere where you can understand the steps for establishing a new pond um, in Marin County. And uh, if you're in Sonoma County, uh, your agricultural ombuds, Karen Giovannini is gonna be a good resource to start with there. That is it for me. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and stop that share. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and see what questions we have. We're, um, To answer, and it looks like uh, one about um, liners in terms of wear and tear, um, holding up if you've got animals, guardian uh, dogs, that sort of thing. I'm actually not going to be able to say that much um, about these liners. I'm not sure if um, Nick or John might have some experience working with those. Um, in terms of durability, again, mostly a, a plastic liner for an on-stream pond, like most of our ranch ponds, is not going to be allowed by Fish and Wildlife because of the, the risk of plastic going downstream, uh, continuing onward um, in the winter when, when your pond is overflowing. But for catchment ponds, like the one we're going to look at in a minute, uh, a liner like that is definitely uh, a viable option. I don't know, Nick or John, if you guys have anything to add on that front. Yeah, the yes. ripping of the ripping of a liner can be uh, it can be problematic. A lot of times, you put some uh, after the liners down. You can put rip wrap, some small boulders around the outside of it to prevent that, especially with dogs or livestock uh, getting on. That prevents them from walking on it. Great, thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that is all the questions I'm seeing on this topic. So I think what we're gonna go ahead and do is head over to our next topic, um, which is looking at a rainwater catchment project. In this case, it's actually at the Hughes Family Dairy, um, <clears throat> but the concept of catching and capturing rain off of farm structures um, and storing them in a pond is something that could apply to uh, any operation. And for that, we're actually gonna go to a video um, that was made by um, the Sonoma County Gold Ridge RCD, uh, William Hart, who couldn't be with us today, went ahead and recorded a presentation. And so we're gonna go ahead and play his presentation. And then afterwards, um, the uh, dairyman, uh, Richard Hughes, uh, that implemented the project is going to be here to answer questions. Welcome everyone. My name is William Hart. I'm a project manager with the Gold Ridge Resource Conservation District. And today I am here to talk to you about drought resiliency. And in particular, I am going to be talking about the rain water catchment project that we did at the Westview Jersey, Westview Jersey's organic dairy in Bodega uh, with Richard and Marilyn Hughes. So here's a outline of the presentation for today. I'm going to show you a video that we put together that uh, tells you about the project. I'm gonna go through the need for rainwater catchment. I'll talk to you about design and considerations in that design that you should be thinking about. I'll give you some details about the pond itself. I'll talk about the funding, the permitting, and some of the challenges surrounding rainwater catchment systems. And then, uh, since I'm presenting this information to you remotely, uh, Richard will be in person with you uh, to give you his perspective and then follow up with some questions and answers from the audience. So once again, my name is William Hart. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, um, 
but let me just jump right in and show you the video for this project. We're here in the town of Bodega. We have 182 acres and we have a organic all Jersey dairy. We milk about 200 cows and we raise all of our young stock here. Our property is on Salmon Creek. We've been here for 40 years and four times the creek has gone dry. Water is always an issue and if there's some way that we can save the water, I think that's a real positive thing to be able to do. In Northern Coastal California, where we have winter rains and then a long dry season, and during that long dry season, when the water is scarce, the demands are even greater. We were trying to find ways for people to have all the water they needed without taking it from the creek or from the groundwater. And what was an obvious solution was rainwater harvesting. And so we looked for some of the largest water users in the watershed, and Richard as a dairy was one of them. His dairy uses 7,000 gallons a day to water the cows as well as to operate his facilities. So how roof water catchment works is the rain falls on the roof and flows into the gutters. In the gutters it flows into pipes which reach a pond. It's stored in the pond and continues to fill and then stored and saved until it's needed in the dry summer months. Using all of the roof space from all of the dairy buildings, we were able to collect 1.4 million gallons, enough water to offset his 7,000 gallons per day over a six month period that he needs to use for dairy operations. It's amazing how much water these roofs collect. So this is one way in order to capture it, to be able to use it for the animals and, and for a business and, and then also in help the wildlife in the creek there. Projects like this pond could be very useful for other ag operations because we've just gone through a several year drought and this may become the new normal. Most dairies are short of water and I think a project like this would really be an asset to them. I really do. Um, so that video is on our YouTube site. It's also on our, um, our website, the RCD website as well. So I'll make sure that I share those links with you if you would like to watch that again. So the, the goal for this project, as was stated in the video, is to replace the dry season riparian diversion that was happening. So this dry season, we're talking about the period between June to October. The project needed to provide a reliable and safe source of drinking water for the livestock. And the purpose of the project was to address the issue of low flow during the summer conditions when that rearing habitat for salmon, for coho salmon is so critical. Critical that there is flow and water in the system. So once again, we're trying to have water for both humans and coho salmon. Um, and this is achieved through planning and then the management of our water supply. So it's important to point out that as a riparian uh, landowner, riparian parcel landowner, that the dairy has a legal right to be able to divert and store that water and to use it. Now, Richard um, took a step towards the, the RCD and expressed his interest in pursuing this project. 
um, you know, Richard's willingness to be a project partner and pro project collaborator, his willingness to participate is, is in a really the key that made this project happen. So there is a forbearance agreement in place that limits Richard's ability to pull from the creek between uh, May and October. There is monitoring of the stream flow, both upstream and downstream of the project site. And this project is, um, you know, it's part of the RCD's water conservation program. We've implemented a number of residential scale uh, rainwater catchment projects. We've uh, also done it on another ranch uh, in Bodega. We've worked with the Bodega Fire Department. There's been a, a number of projects throughout, um, throughout our district and also throughout uh, Sonoma RCD's district. So, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into the appropriateness and, and uh, the, just the, whether or not the feasibility, I guess, of a rainwater catchment pond. You need a appropriate site. Um, in our case, we had a site that, um, you know, it was situated so that we could, we could locate the pond below where those buildings that were catching the rain off of. So this is a gravity fed system. So the, the rainwater is diverted through those pipes, it's conveyed to the pond, and it's all just gravity fed that is, that's making that happen. There are endangered coho salmon in the system, so that made it a priority for the funders. Um, you know, their adaptability uh, throughout just the, the design and through the implementation process, uh, we learned things and, and changed things as the project was unfolding. Um, like one of those is that we had originally designed for the conveyance pipes to be above ground, um, making their way from the downspouts um, and making their way over to the pond. Richard offered to uh, remove concrete in different sections so that we could place those pipes underground, which is a much better uh, location for those pipes. Um, we also changed, uh, there, there are just, I guess, numerous things that we were able to be, to employ adaptive management as the project was unfolding. Um, you know, there was a lot of trust in our in the, the relationship between Richard and the RCD. Um, there was a, a willingness to experiment on Richard's part. Um, and, you know, just the fact that there was funding in place for both the planning, the design, and then also the construction. So it's really all of these different factors that made the project happen. So this picture is showing the overall, all the different funding sources that we were able to utilize for this project. Uh, the red figure is uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife. They provided the largest portion of the funding. Uh, this was through their fisheries restoration grant program. Um, and then we had two smaller uh, relative to, to DFW, we had two funding sources through the State Coastal Conservancy. We also were able to get cost share and then also technical assistance through the uh, USDA NRCS. Um, and then we were able to use some of the North Coast Integrated Regional Water 
uh, water management program. Um, that is the North Coast Resources Partnership uh, funding. So the total project cost was uh, close to a million dollars, $905,000 for, so if you calculate that out, 1.4 million gallons divided by that project cost, it's about 65 cents per gallon. Um, but if you spread that out over 20 years, it's about uh, three cents per gallon. You know, compare this to a water truck currently, you know, I've been uh, involved in a project way, where we are paying about $225 uh, for 3,500 gallons of water. That comes out to be about six cents per gallon. Um, you know, we would need two of these trucks every day for six months to be able to cover um, the one point, or you know, the just the, the daily water needs of the dairy is 7,000 gallons. Um, so, you know, just, just some reference there. Um, and then this is a timeline of the project from when the design began back in 2012 and then through project completion, uh, when we had the final delivery of the floating pond cover in July of 2018. So that's a six year time period. Um, we started the design in, in 2012, construction and funding uh, when we had that in place actually occurred in May of 2015. Construction of the pond was completed uh, by February of 2016. Um, but, you know, so this was a, a long-term project, um, six years in the making or six years in the, in the implementation. Um, and I'm sure Richard can talk about uh, just kind of the, all the ups and downs in that time, in that time frame. So now I have some pictures uh, to show you. This is a, a picture of the uh, before conditions, the, the location where, the, where now the rainwater catchment pond is located. Uh, this was a kind of an auxiliary uh, manure pond that was on site. This is a, a picture of the pond as it was being constructed with uh, Shaper Engineering are the folks that did the actual construction. And then I have some pictures of the changes that we made, um, like in, in, the, in the gutters and in the pipes that convey the, the, um, the water to the, to the pond. So this is a before picture. You can see that there are, I think there are just two downspouts that were originally on this freestall barn. Um, Richard was using uh, that white Schedule 40 PVC pipe as his gutters. And then we changed it to, uh, this is Schedule 80 PVC pipe. That is the gray pipe that's there. Um, so there's some new rafter tails and a new fascia board that went in as well to support those gutters. And we increased the number of uh, downspouts from two to four. So maybe I'll just show this again. Here's the before and here's the after. You can really see the difference in the, in those rafter tails and then the fascia board. Um, and this is the actual, uh, the fabrication that happened for those uh, gutters. It was just a solid piece of uh, Schedule 80 pipe that they were able to, to rig up this, uh, this contraption to be able to cut the pipe um, and fabricate those on site. So then the, you know, so like I said, these, these pipes were cut and then um, the, the guys that put in the gutters came up with that um, small piece of, of white PVC that's that's around the the bolt that is uh, the the 
the gutter is attached to that fascia board. You know, since we cut that PVC pipe, it had a tendency that it wanted to, to twist and turn and close back on itself. Um, so these uh, white PVC pipe, little, little pieces of PVC were placed in there to, to keep that gutter spread and keep it, um, keep it open. And then here's a, a picture of the pond uh, just before, or actually on the day that we were installing the, the pond liner. You'll notice some of these uh, black pipes right here. These are vents that are all underlaid beneath the pond liner. The pond liner is right here. It's ready to be rolled out. So those pipes are there to capture any gases that may leak up. Uh, we don't want to uh, we don't want to impact the integrity of the pond liner. Uh, so those vents are there for gas exchange. And then you'll also notice this trench that was dug around all the way all the way around the perimeter of the pond. That's where the pond liner was uh, placed into it, and then soil was placed on top of that to keep it in place. Here is the pond after one of our, our first rainstorms. So the, the pond is filling up with water. You can see the pond liner has been installed. Um, and then a, another part of our project was we had to deal with the evaporative losses from the pond. Um, there was no evaporation pan data in the bodega area. There are two reference sites that we use. There was a, a, a site up in Healdsburg where there is some data from that. And there was a site up in Ferndale. So the, the site in Healdsburg estimated uh, evaporative losses is 61.7 inches per year. Now that site is hotter and sunnier than Bodega. And then the, the site in Ferndale was about 31 inches and that's cooler and foggy. So our educated guess was to use 48 inches per year. And to address that, those evaporative losses, um, there is a floating pond cover um, that is um, over the top of the pond. So these are just a bunch of little, these are just plastic pieces. They're, uh, it's, a, it's a rhombus shape. So they are all just individual little units um, that float. They provide uh, coverage and keep the water covered so that we are limiting um, you know, loss through evaporation, loss through the sun. And then also, you know, when birds are flying up over, overhead, they're looking down and they're just seeing this black surface. They're not seeing open water or, uh, you know, possible habitat. For them. So this is the floating pond cover. Permits. What kind of permits were required for this project? So the big one, um, I guess, or the first one that comes to mind is uh, CEQA. CEQA was covered through the DFW, through the Department of Fish and Wildlife funding. Um, so that included both the biological and archeological surveys that go along with that. The water board, um, we had a uh, erosivity waiver that was in place because of the uh, the SWIP that was that was part of this project. So a SWIP is a stormwater pollution prevention plan. So we had a staff member who was SWIP certified, and he was able to put together uh, the application for that. So there was just a a two hundred dollar application fee that went along with that to the water board. Um, the RCD has an exemption that we qualify for, for the county grading permit. We just needed to provide um, permit Sonoma with copies of, our, um, copies of our construction plans and then also the estimates on 
how much soil was being was being um, you know moved. There were no water rights that were needed because this is a rainwater catchment system. So this is uh, there's no there's no Department of Water Rights um, permit or anything needed. It's uh, in California. Uh, you're able to store and capture uh, rainwater. It's not regulated, and in some states, uh, rainwater is regulated, not here. Um, this was, since this is a public fund, publicly funded project, there are prevailing wage requirements. So this was um, the, the contractor who did the implementation had to, had to and the, and had, well, they had to comply with those prevailing wage requirements and the, the reporting requirements that go along with that. And there's oversight um, from a, a, a prevailing wage outfit that we were contracted with. Um, and then also there was, since we were able to, to qualify for, for NRCS funding, there was additional engineering that was required, uh, engineering review, and then also just the, um, you know, we had to comply and meet the, the NRCS engineering standards for this project. So what are, what are some of the challenges that are associated with rainwater catchment systems? Um, you know, it requires a lot of roof space in order to, to generate the, the volume of water that's needed. Um, I think dairies are, uniquely situated um, to be able to, to, to generate the, the amount of water that's needed. Um, uh, you know, just the, 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 there are five buildings that are, that we're catching water from for this project that are, are contributing flow um, into that, into that pond. Um, that, you know, that number of buildings is you're not going to find that on like a rangeland site, right? So, um, just one of the other reasons why dairies are particularly attractive for rainwater catchment projects. Um, you know, we also needed a site where there was sufficient room for us to even construct a pond. Um, it's a large, it's a large footprint that this pond uh, takes up. Um, and, and fortunately, Richard's dairy uh, was a perfect site for this. You know, that, and there's also the, the geologic conditions and the, the soils conditions. Uh, there's a, a geotechnical report and analysis that went along uh, with all of this just to make sure that the soils and the geologic conditions were appropriate for a, a pond to be constructed. Um, and you know, we wanted to keep the the the, the, the design as simple as possible. Um, this is a, and you know, one ways that we achieve that is is that this is a, a gravity fed system. So we wanted to keep the number of moving parts to a minimum because Richard has enough things on his plate that he has to be uh, thinking about. And then you know, just that it takes time. It took us, like I said, in that in that. Uh, the timeline, it took us six years from um, when the design began to when implementation was, was completed. So I'd just like to take a moment to recognize our funders. This is uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife is our primary funder, the Coastal Conservancy. Our partners at the USDA and RCS, um, they provided, um, you know, funding through their EQIP program and also just the, the technical service that was provided, um, their consultation from this, in this project. Um, the Pernusky Chatham is, are the folks that design the system. Um, RGH are the, the folks that did the geotechnical, uh, not only the report, but also the, the on-site, um, the field work to, to make sure that the soils were being compacted accordingly. 
And then uh, Schaefer Engineering, John Schaefer is, is the contractor who, who, um, who constructed the pond. Um, and we did this in partnership with the North Coast Resource Conservation and Development Council, North Coast RCNDC, um, who they've now changed their names to, to Conservation Works. Um, and then, you know, I'd also just like to recognize uh, Richard and Marilyn um, and their, their dairy for their willingness and their participation in this project. So I'll just leave you um, with my contact information and, and Brittany Jensen is our executive director. Both of our emails are provided there. Um, you can check us out on the web at goldridgercd.org. Our phone number is here. Um, you know, please, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, give us a call, check out our website. Um, and with that, I am going to bid you bid you well. Um, thank you for your attention, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Okay, big big thank you to William Hart and and uh, the folks at the Gold Ridge uh, RCD for putting that presentation together. Um, we have a few minutes to do some questions about this project, and I know we have Richard Hughes here on Zoom. Um, so I want to want to thank Richard for being with us, and uh, we've got a couple of questions that have come in, Richard, that maybe you can um, give us a little bit more detail. One question is just around algae and whether or not that's been an issue for you and how you control that in your pond. Yes, there is a bit of algae in there now. Um, with the cover, you don't allow as much sunlight to get in there in order to get the algae to grow. Um, there's a little bit, there's a little bit of tinting of green in there. Uh, the wind out here is pretty strong sometimes and it pushes those uh, covers and leaves a little bit of exposure of the sun to the water. Um, I been playing around with an idea of the possibility of putting like maybe some ropes or something across there in order to hold it so that the, they don't slide through the wind. Um, the only problem is, is when the pond is full, when it's totally full, because as it, as it draws down, those uh, cover things, they lay against the side. And so finally it gets down, there's nothing, it's just total black on, all the way across. Okay, but it sounds like you haven't done anything, um, anything chemical or anything else to try and control the algae or stop the algae. No, because that water goes to the cows, and I just don't want a chance to putting anything in the in the cows' diet that's going to be detrimental for for the cows and for milk production. Got it. One other question, Richard, and and I think I might know the answer you're going to give, but someone has asked about the use of tanks or bladders as a way of capturing water in a, in a rainwater catchment system like this. Um, and was that ever part of your discussion or was it all just straight to a pond? No, it was never brought up in, in our discussion. Uh, they approached me with the idea of the pond. Uh, I have a, a pond on here that's a dam pond dam pond and um, that water most of comes well, comes from the neighbor across the way but it also comes off the road and so that one's a little bit different um, I had been pumping all the all the years from Salmon Creek because Cameron Creek runs through my property and I had rights to it I, when I first moved here I did get water rights in order to pump so I had those rights in, in, in place um, as, as William mentioned, the pond did go, uh, the, the creek did go dry for four, for four years. It is dry, bone dry today. Um, and I'm so thankful to have this catchment there, if, if what is there. Um, you asked about the algae. Um, I didn't have any, I don't think I have too much problem with algae, but I did have a problem with um, grass growing on, on the top of it. It was hydrophonic. The wind would blow in seed and what have you, and the grass would start growing on there. And it got, we had quite a bit of it on this, this last year. So my, my two hired men and myself, we went out there and we made a grafling hook and on a 
to put it on a long uh, on a rope and we threw it out there and we could able to grab the grass and pull it out of the pond so now the pond is all clean uh with no grass I, I thought it saw a little bit of green tint so we'll go back and we'll just go ahead and pull it out as we go along um part of the, the things that i see that i need to do is put some type of a fence around it uh in order to it will help slow the wind down and it'll also slow, slow down any contaminants that will go in there so th those are some things that i'm gonna they're on the, in the works in order to go forward with great uh, Thank you so much, Richard. And I think you're going to be staying on um, for the livestock session that comes right after this yes, to yes. answer more questions. Is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to, to do all that there for you. That's Thank great. You. Thank you. I see that we're coming up against 1030 right now, which is the, the ending time for our first half um, and not seeing any further questions in the Q&A. Um, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is thank uh, everyone who, who participated today, um, Nick Goodman from the NRCS, um, John Gorman, um, and uh, just encourage everyone, if you want to know more about Richard's project, we're going to, um, we're going to go into that project a little bit more in the next session, the livestock session. It'll be the first thing we cover, and so um, Richard will be there to answer more questions if there are things coming up with you, just stay on for that second session. We'll go straight into the topic. Um, as we mentioned also tomorrow, the 30th, all day is going to be a, a sign up session with the Farm Services Agency uh, for folks who wanna start paperwork to get some financial relief tied to replacement forage as well as water hauling uh, for livestock. Um, that's happening up at the Sonoma County Farm Bureau office. You can see the, uh, the information here. Um, do call and sign up if you want to participate in that. Uh, NRCS will also be there with information about the EQIP CIC program. Uh, so that's uh, somewhere where you could get some information about using that program or applying to that program to do a project. Um, and with that, I just want to thank everybody who came in for our session today. Um, Again, if you have questions um, or, or want assistance with your specialty crop operation, dealing with the drought, developing resilience for the future, don't hesitate to reach out to UC Cooperative Extension in Marin and Sonoma counties, as well as to uh, NRCS and the RCDs folks who all contributed to today's webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here. And if you want to stay on for the livestock portion, which will go from 1030 to noon, just stick around. Um, we'll launch into that in just a minute. And uh, Randy Black's going to take over for that session. Thanks very much. <laughs>